say that loud. I mean, they invited me. <laughs> but it, it's true. The sculpture here is fantastic. And my wife and I went to a place called La Louisiana in, uh, in Denmark. That was terrific, but it wasn't this good. <laughs> and I'm not saying that just because I'm an American. If it had been better, I would say it was better. <laughs> but as beautiful as it was, what I will remember visually was the Forsythia driving up here. I have a Forsythia, <clears throat> you know, it's an industrial plant, basically. <laughs> I mean, plant, not in the sense of, you know, I work at the Chevy plant. But it's, plant actually has an older meaning uh, than an industrial space. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just so, I have this little, it's not so small, the one outside my window, but it got screwed up, got clipped a little bit too much. Sort of like me, uh, old age, sitting in. But when I came to here, it was just, it was breathtaking. I made the driver slow down. I didn't have a camera. So I had to look at it very hard, take it in, and process it. And now I have a memory. It's a, it's a new way of going about your life. <laughs> sort of like being a computer, you know, a telephone that takes pictures and all that. I'm my own telephone, except I can't make long distance calls. <laughs> the Forsythia reminded me of this poem in which I have Forsythia. And I should put it in more poems because it's meant so much to me. It's called My Brother Antonio the Baker, and I model my brother after someone who might have, have, have wanted terribly to write the poems of Antonio Machado. I give my brother the name Antonio because he's, he's fallen in love with the great poems of Antonio Machado. I don't know if you know his work. He's a great Spanish poet of the generation of 98. Just fantastic. A poet of great simplicity and power and loveliness. And this guy in the poem just can't shut up. He just keeps going on and on. And the other guy, who's based on me, is kind of a schmuck. <laughs> He's getting tired of his brother's romance with poetry. My brother Antonio the Baker. Did the wind blow that night? Oh, the other day I read this and I had to stop in the middle of the poem, so I'm going to stop right now. Uh, there's a point in the poem where I say that the prisoners in the drunk tank are dreaming of a breakfast of horse cock and mattress stuffing. That is Wonder Bread. That's the mattress stuffing. And bologna, which the police call. Do you want your horse cock and uh, mattress stuffing? I know because I was there. It wasn't that bad. They let you out in the morning. Uh, my brother Antonio the Baker. Did the wind blow that night? When did it not? I'd ask you if you hadn't gone underground lugging the answer with you. Twenty-eight years ago, on our way home after a twelve-hour shift baking Wonder Bread for the sleeping prisoners in the drunk tank at the Canfield Station, dreaming of a breakfast of horsecock and mattress stuff. Oh, the luxuries of 1955. How fully we lived, the working classes and the law-abiding dregs on buttered toast and grilled cheese sandwiches as the nation braced itself for pâté and pasta. To myself, I smell like a new mother minus the aura of talcum and the airborne acrid aromas of cotton diapers. Today, I'd be labeled nurturing and bountiful instead of vegetal and weird. A blurred moon was out. We both saw it. I know because leaning back, eyes closed on ruined sky, 
you did your thing, welcoming the bright orb waning in the west. Quote, moon that rained down its silver coins on the darkened duero in the sleeping fields of Soria. Pure Machado. Did I look like you? My face, anonymous and pure, bleached with flour, my eyes glistening with the power of neon light or self-love. Two grown men side by side, one babbling joyfully to the universe that couldn't care less, while the other practiced for middle age. A single crow settled on the boiler above the Chinese restaurant, his feathers riffling, and I took it for a sign. A second sign was the couple exiting the all-night pharmacy. The man came first through the glass door, a small white sack in hand, and let the door swing shut. Then she appeared, one hand covering her eyes to keep the moonlight at bay. They stood not talking while he looked first left, then right, then left again as flakes of darkness sifted upward toward the street light. The place began to rumble as though this were the end. You spoke again, only this time you described someone humble, walking alone in darkness. I could see the streetcar turning off Joy Road, swaying down the tracks toward us, its windows on fire. There must have been a wind, a west wind, what else could have blown the aura of Forsythia through the town and materialized one cross-town streetcar never before on time? A spring wind freighted with hope. I remember thinking that at last you might shut up. An old woman stood to give you her seat as though you were angelic or pregnant. When her eyes spilled over with happiness, I saw she took your words to heart as I never could. Maybe she recalled the duero, the fields of sleep and moonlight. Maybe the words were music to her, original and whole, words that took her home to Soria or Krakow or wherever. Maybe she was not an old woman at all, but an oracle in drag who saw you as you were, who <coughs> saw, too, you couldn't last the night. are fascinated by poets, and then, you know, there I was, writing about my beloved Antonio Machado, uh, who's never really been translated as well as he should be, uh, and his translators include me. This is about a uh, poem about Brooklyn, a poem about poetry, it's called On the Meeting of Garcia Lorca and Hart Crane. And they did meet at least once. We know of one meeting. They may have met more times than that. Because shortly thereafter, Crane, or Lorca, who was supposedly studying English at Columbia, but wasn't, uh, disappeared from his rooms at Columbia for a week or so. Both men were fated to die shortly. Uh, this was 29. Crane would die in 32. He would uh, leap off the stern of his ship. And in 36, late July of 36, uh, the fascists, the Falange, members of the Falange, the fascist party of Spain, the civil war had just started would drag him out to a hillside along with several other people and assassinate him. But for at least one night, these two amazing men, both were gay, by the way, uh, Crane had no problem with that fact. Uh, Garcia Lorca had much greater difficulty coming from such a machismo society of Spain and 
and nothing. On the meeting of Garcia, Lorca, and Hart Crane, Brooklyn, 1929. Of course, Crane's been drinking and has no idea who this curious Andalusian is, unable even to speak the language of poetry. The young man who brought them together knows both Spanish and English, but he has a headache from jumping back and forth from one language to another. For a moment's relief, he goes to the window to look down on the East River darkening below as the early night comes on. Something flashes across his sight, a double vision of such horror, he has to slap both his hands across his mouth to keep from screaming. Let's not be frivolous. Let's not pretend the two poets gave each other wisdom or love or even a good time. Let's not invent a dialogue of such eloquence that even the ants in your own house won't forget it. The two greatest poetic geniuses alive meet. And what happens? A vision comes to an ordinary man staring at a filthy river. Have you ever had a vision? Have you ever shaken your head to pieces and jerked back at the image of your young son falling through open space? Not from the stern of a ship bound from Veracruz to New York, but from the roof of the building he works on. Have you risen from bed to pace until dawn to beg a merciless God to take these pictures away? Oh yes. Let's bless the imagination. It gives us the myths we live by. Let's bless the visionary power of the human, the only animal that's got it. Bless the exact image of your father dead and mine dead. Bless the images that stalk the corners of our sight and will not let go. The young man was my cousin, Arthur Lieberman then a language student at Columbia, who told me all this before he died quietly in his sleep in 1983 in a hotel in Perugia. A good man, Arthur. He survived graduate school. Later came home to Detroit and sold pianos right through the Depression. He loaned my brother a used one to compose his hideous songs on, which Arthur thought were genius. What an imagination Arthur had. 